What have we been talking about in this class? Anybody know? What is it? Yes, figures of speech in the Bible. True or false, the Bible is filled with figures of speech. Oh, it's unbelievable, guys, how many figures of speech are found in the pages of God's Word. Who was it that gave us the Bible? Oh, man, come on. Who gave us the Bible? Yeah, God did, folks. The Holy Spirit of God, okay? The Holy Spirit of God revealed every word to those inspired men. So the Bible comes from God Himself, okay? And so I find it interesting that the Holy Spirit is the one who filled the Word of God with all of these figures of speech for us to use uh, and to come to an understanding of, okay? Um, folks... Uh, we've been talking about these figures for uh, the past four studies, and this is our fifth one. And we're going to be talking about three more figures of speech in our lesson today, if we have enough time, okay? The very first one is called hyperbole. Okay, no, not really. That's not, that's not the way it's said. Anybody know how to say it? Ah, there you go, yes, hyperbole. Okay, I can just see you going home today. What did y'all study in Bible class? Oh, we studied hyperboles. No, we studied hyperboles, okay? And we're going to study anabasis and then catabasis, okay? Anabasis and catabasis. And you may know what hyperbole is, but most of us have never heard of anabasis or catabasis, at least uh, not with regard to our study of the Bible. So we'll go into that just a little bit. The main thing to understand is the concept. Not so much remember the names, but remember the concepts, okay? So let's start with the first one. Let's start with hyperbole. It is really a Greek word that is a form of two words, okay? The first word is hyper, okay? H-Y-P-E-R. And in the Greek language, that means over and beyond. Okay, over and beyond. And then you have bole, B-O-L-E-E, -E, uh, as far as the way it's spelled in English, bole, hyperbole. Uh, that word bole means to cast, okay, to cast. So it literally means, notice in our definition there, going beyond, overshooting, look at that last word, excess, excess. Now notice the definition. This figure is so called because the expression adds to the sense so much that it exaggerates it and enlarges or diminishes it more than really meant in fact. The most simple definition, though, is the very next one, okay? Hyperbole is an obvious and intentional exaggeration, okay? Y'all go home every Sunday and you say something like this, That preacher preaches forever! No, I don't. You get lunch. What do you mean by that? That's an, that's an extended exaggeration. I'm about tired of it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, my wife even said that. Oh, you just preach forever today. <laughs> um, but it, but it, see, it, it's an extended exaggeration, right? To show, man, he preached a long, long time. Okay, um, there's two points that we need to make about these extended exaggerations, okay, before we get into some, these are examples that I'm going to show you, but uh, there are a couple of warnings that we need to understand. Sometimes there is an exaggeration that is given, and it's applied to everybody in a group, and yet not everybody in that group is that way, okay? The reason that the writer, the Holy Spirit, does not exempt some from the group is because if he did, it would dull the point of the exaggeration that he's trying to make. Okay, So let's look at an illustration. And I've, I've tried to keep the verses in your notes so that you don't have to look these up. Uh, notice Titus chapter 1, verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Boy, they're, 
That's a good one, isn't it? Okay. The Cretans. Now I wonder, are all Cretans liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies? You think there was at least one good Cretan? But he didn't say that, did he? He said, the Cretans are, and then describe, oh, it's a hyperbole, okay? What he's doing is, he's saying this, in mass, in general, okay, there are a lot of these Cretans who are this way, okay? They're very distrustful, evil, gluttonous group of individuals, okay? And the reason he doesn't give us the exemptions is because it would dull the point, wouldn't it? Well, not all of them are that way. See, today we have to be so politically correct that you can't say anything about anybody unless you talk about the exceptions too, okay? But we we've, but do the same thing oftentimes, don't we? Use car salesmen. You can't trust them. Every one of them? Guys, I... I <laughs> yep. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Uh, we say all kinds of things about our political leaders, right? You know, politicians are corrupt. All of them? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> but the reality is that we use these kind of expressions at times as well, right? Women are nags. Oh, I knew I'd get some no's that time. I heard the men go, Amen. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Prompting. <laughs> Prompting. Oh, mercy. Synonyms. <laughs> but um, I see that we, we use these kind of expressions in our own daily life all the time. And, and we, when, we, when we use an inclusive group, we're not trying to condemn everybody in the group necessarily, okay? Uh, notice the next statement that's made down there, guys. Uh, sometimes exaggerations are not intended to be as literal as as they sound, okay? Jesus makes a strong hyperbole here in this verse in Luke 14, 20. If any man come to me, watch this, and hate not. Wow, it's pretty strong language, isn't it? Look who he has to hate. His father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters. Yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Can you imagine walking the aisle to become a Christian and the preacher looks at you and says, Do you hate your dad? Yeah, I hate him, despise him, can't stand him. Oh, good, you can be a Christian. Is that what Jesus is talking about? What does he mean by that? Love less. Okay, see, he uses very strong language, a hyperbole, hate, okay, to get across his idea, okay? These people that I just talked about, even yourself, cannot come before who? Before God. You can't love them more than you love God. So he uses hate to show how strong we have to love God, okay, when we come to Him. So uh, just be very careful when you watch the exaggerations. Don't make them apply to everybody necessarily. And sometimes realize they're very strong and they're not intended just to be as literal as maybe the way it sounds. And we're going to talk about another one of those in just a minute. Okay, let's look at some examples of hyperbole. The first one's found in Exodus 8, verse 17. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. All the dust. Folks, that would mean there would be no more what? There'd be no more dust. There'd be no more even ground. Okay? Because dust comes from what? comes from the ground, okay? And so there'd be nothing to even walk on. What's he mean when he says, all the land became, or all the dust became lice? What does he mean? Oh, yeah. You wouldn't want to be there when that lice hit, okay? There's a lot, a lot of lice that came, okay? I don't know about you, but I've seen some folks with just a little bit of lice. And guess what? That's enough, isn't it? Okay. Notice this next one, Deuteronomy one twenty eight. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. Man, walled up to heaven. What does he mean? Yeah, they were tall, tall walls. You go into uh, New York and guess what? You got buildings that are as tall as the heavens, aren't they? Okay, because 
It just means that they're extremely tall, okay? 200, 300 foot wall, that's a pretty high wall. You know, you get up against it as a little five foot dude like me, okay? I'm a little taller than that. Go home and tell everybody, preacher's five foot, okay? I'm five seven. You put those seven inches on there, okay? But if I walked up to a hundred foot wall, I guess what I'm thinking, man, that thing reaches up to the heavens, doesn't it? Jeannie? There you go. Yeah, they don't really uh, scrape, you know, uh, the skies per se, but that's what they're called. Here's this exaggeration, this big, this next one that I'm talking about where it's really, really powerful. Listen to what Jesus says. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. Man, if everybody plucked out their eyeball because they lusted after something, We'd have a bunch of blind folk running around, wouldn't we? Remember in the Garden of Eden? And when Eve saw that the tree was good for food, folks, lust of the eyes, right? David looked off that balcony, and who did he see? He saw Bathsheba. He saw Bathsheba, lust of the eyes, okay? We can lust after cars. Can't we? Ooh-wee. I sure would like to have that Mercedes. Okay? Or whatever it is. We, we can lust after tons of things. And every time we lust, if we had to pluck our eyeballs out, literally, folks, we'd be blind in probably half a day. Wouldn't we? That's not what he's talking about. But he's using this hyperbole. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. Uh-oh, now we got what? Armless blind folk walking around. <laughs> Don't we? I mean, if it, it's, he's not talking. What, what does he mean by this? What, what is he talking about? Why, why does he, what is he really saying? Do what? Get rid of it. What? Yeah, it, it, you know, whatever it is, guys, get it out of your life, right? Not, not a literal plucking out of the eye or cutting off of the hand, but it, whatever is causing you to be involved in these kind of things, get rid of every bit of it, okay? Because you don't want to what? You don't want to perish in hell, do you? Okay? It, Oh, yeah, yeah there, that's, an, that's another good point. It shows you how serious this thing is, you know. Uh, if you really had to make a choice of plucking your eye out and going to heaven or keeping your eye and going to hell, which would you want? You know, it's a very serious matter because, you know, we take our bodies, uh, you know, pretty seriously. Notice Jude 21, verse 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. <clears throat> could we have had a scribe go around and follow Jesus every minute of his life and write down everything that he did? When did his ministry begin? At what age? 30 years of age. And he was around 33, 33 and a half when he died. So three and a half years of many, you know, we could have somebody walk around and, and everything that he did, we could take note of it, couldn't we? Put them in a book, and guess what? We could have kept record of every one of the things that he did. But John says, oh no, that's not possible. He said the world itself could not contain the books. And you say, oh yeah, we could have, we could have documented all that. Had encyclopedia of everything Jesus did. What does he mean? What, what does he say? Yeah, he's just trying to express how many wonderful works that Jesus did, guys. Okay? And he's just using a hyperbole to get our mind. You know, in our minds, we can almost see the, the, the world and all these books, you know, not able to be on the world. They're out there in space somewhere because of all these great works that Jesus did. He was just a man of wonderful works, wasn't he? Acts 17, verse 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Man, turn the world upside down. 
Oh, Paul and them, boy, they got out there in space and found a way to latch on to the world and just turn it upside down, didn't they? Is that what he means? What's he talking about? Turn the world upside down. Had a significant impact. Yes, had a significant impact. Rattled the very core of society, didn't they? And not just in one place, but in a large number of places. What was the world at this particular time? Anybody, what is it? Yeah, it'd be the Roman Empire. You know, when you get uh, in Luke chapter 2, all the world should be taxed. Okay? Uh, it was the Roman Empire at that particular time. So turn the world upside down. Folks, the Roman Empire was literally put on edge because of the preaching and teaching of the gospel. Okay? And uh, so that's what these individuals are indicating. Now watch this next one. Hebrews 12, verse 22. But you're come to Mount Sinai. Now this is talking about us as Christians, okay? But ye are come to Mount Sinai, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and unto an innumerable company of angels. A what? Innumerable company of angels. I wonder if you went to God and said, God, how many angels did you create? And he said, I don't know, they're innumerable. Would he say that? No, he wouldn't say that. He could tell you the exact number of angels that he has created. Guys, we could line the angels up, right? Get a calculator, get a counter, and just let them pass through, and we could just count everyone. And eventually, we'd get them all counted, wouldn't we? So what does he mean, an innumerable company of angels? Last night I watched the ball drop, did y'all? I did, I, woke, I woke, waked up at 5 till 12 and watched it and went back to sleep. <clears throat> I'm serious, I went to sleep in my chair and I just happened to wake up at 5 to 12. Okay, and I watched the ball drop. Uh, guess what, there were an innumerable company of nuts in New York last night. Not really. They were just people, okay? My daughter's been down there, so maybe there were some nuts down. I don't <laughs> um, But uh, there's there just a lot of people, guys. You, you couldn't, by looking at the television, count how many were there, could you? That's what they mean, just a huge number of people. So be aware that in Scripture, there's a lot of these hyperboles that you'll come across, these extended, huge exaggerations about things, okay? And uh, very, very interesting. Notice next. The anabasis. Again, it comes from a Greek word. Ana means up. Basis means step. So literally what? To step up. Okay. So what you have is, in a verse, you'll have an increment, an increase of statements that mean similar things. Okay. And he'll go from the least and then to the, to the greatest. As, as he steps. And one of those is found in Psalm 1 verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now what does he do next? Nor standeth okay, in what? In the way of the sinner. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Let me ask you. Here you got some sinners out there. And is it better just to walk by them, stand with them, or sit with them? See, just to walk by them is a little less harmful, right? Okay, just, uh, I just want to get over kind of near them and I'll just walk past them. Okay, see what they're doing, see what they're saying. And then the next time you come and you get up close and guess what you do? You just kind of stand there. And the next thing you know, guess what you're doing? You're sitting with them, folks. You're participating. You're right in the mix. You're one of their number. You see the gradual increase. Okay, you go from walking to standing to what? The sitting. If you study those three words that describe the sinners, they are also an anabasis. Okay? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, and then you have what? Sit in the seat of the scornful. Okay? You've got what? 
What group's first? Ungodly, sinners, and then what? Scorners, okay? Ungodly people have in their minds, I don't believe in God. Okay, they're just against God. Sinners are individuals who in their lives, they act out transgression against the will of God. And the scornful are the individual who not only act out their sin against God, they will also take big, bold stands in opposition against God and mock the Almighty God. Okay, So you have uh, <clears throat> two or three anabasis right in that one verse. Notice Psalm 7 verse 5. Let the enemy persecute my soul. Take it. Notice the first thing he's going to do is what? Persecute him. Okay, now notice the second thing. Let him tread down my life upon the earth. What's he doing now? Now he's tr- not, only, not only is he persecuting, he's treading him down. What do you mean? He's taking his life from him, folks. Okay, he's, he's putting him to death. Tread my life down. And then notice the last thing he says. And lay mine honor in the dust. Okay. It's one thing for you to do something to my body. It's another thing for you to do something to my honor. Okay? Who I am. Okay? And to defame my name itself. You know, do whatever you want to with my body, but don't destroy my honor, right? So what do they do? They persecute him. They put him in the dust. Tread upon him. Bring him to death. And then also what? Lay his honor there as well. So the progression gets worse and worse and worse. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 8. He's talking about the Philippians, um, I mean the Corinthians, <clears throat> and how they perceive themselves. Okay, And he says this, Ye are full! Okay. Now, can a man be full and not be rich? Oh yeah. That's probably the way most of us feel about ourselves, right? Over the course of the holidays, we're, we're full. But if I were to ask, are you rich? Oh, no, not me. I'm not rich. I'm just middle class. Okay? So being full is not equivalent to rich. But then he says what? Ye are rich. Now, are all rich people in powerful, powerful positions? No. I had a couple of old uh, uncles who never got married. And guess what? Pretty wealthy old codgers. Okay. I'm serious, man. You know, if you ever saw them, they had on their uh, uh, overalls, had their uh, uh, hush puppy shoe likes on, had their socks rolled down, had a pack of cigarettes right here. Well, not cigarettes, it's roll your own. Okay, right there. I, I never forget them. Okay. Drove an old uh, Harvester International pickup. I mean, you had to push it to get it started. You know, pop the clutch. And, uh, you know, you'd never think. Those guys died, and guess what? They left a sizable amount of money. Okay? <clears throat> huh? <laughs> no, nobody got that. They bought it and had to buy a new one finally. <clears throat> so you can be rich and not a powerful person, okay? So you're full, now they're what? Now we're rich, now we'll look what he also says. You have what? Reigned as kings without us. See the progression? Full, rich, reigned as kings. Okay? That's called a what? Anabasis. Okay? You're stepping up as he speaks about the situation. Okay? Now you have what's called a catabasis. Okay? That's another Greek word. Kata means down. Basis means what? To step. So now we have a stepping down instead of a stepping up. He starts at the highest level and then proceeds downward as they talk. And I've given you some illustrations of that. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Here it comes. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Folks, eagles what? Fly. I don't know about you. I'd rather fly than run. Wouldn't you? I'd love to be a bird for a day. You know I really would. I'd love to just be a bird for a day, just fly around. I'm not going to go out there and get them wings and stuff, fly the way some of do, people do off these mountains. Okay. But just be fun. It's a lot better to fly. But notice what then he goes on to say. 
and not be weary. They, I mean, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not run. Fly, run, then what? Walk. See, the progression is what? Downward, a catabasis. Okay? Downward. Um, <clears throat> there's several that we have in Scripture. Notice the next one, Jeremiah 9, verse 1. Oh, that my head were waters. Okay, he wants his whole head to be what? To be waters. Okay, that's how, this is how much sorrow that he has, folks. Okay, that his whole, oh, that my whole head were just filled with water. That's the way he feels like. And then he goes on, he says, and mine eyes a what? A fountain. Okay, now it's not my whole head, now it's just my what? I adjust my eyeballs. They're popping out fountains of water, okay, because of his uh, uh, lament. And then lastly says, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Okay, so that's just the normal way of what? <coughs> Shedding tears, right? You know, first of all, you got a whole head full of water. Second, you got eyeballs that are what? Fountains of water. Or now I'm just wanting to what? Just cry. Okay, so there's that downward progression again. Man, time flies, doesn't it? <clears throat> Daniel 2. And um, in Daniel 2, you have Daniel standing before Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's dreamed a dream about this great image, right? And that image is described in terms of different types of materials, right? Gold, silver, what else? Brass, iron and clay. Guys, notice the digression, right? Gold is first, then what? Silver, then what? Brass, then iron, iron and clay. Okay, there's a downward progression. And the reason that he uses that is to show the power and the strength of each one of the nations that is to come. Okay, he tells Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, thou art this head of gold. In other words, you're the most powerful, the most rich of all of these kingdoms that I'm talking about. Okay, But then after you, there's going to come a second empire, and it's like unto what? Silver. Okay, What empire is that? The Medo-Persian Empire. Okay, They're not quite as strong, not quite as powerful as the Roman kingdom. So their power decreases. The next kingdom that comes along is brass. Okay, the Grecian Empire. Okay. And then the next one that comes along is the Roman Empire. And eventually the Roman Empire is going to be split into ten different fragments and it's going to be like iron and clay. Okay, not nearly as strong and powerful as Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was. So you see that uh, descent in that one. <clears throat> Notice also Philippians 2, you have a, both a catabasis and also an anabasis. Okay, he starts off with the catabasis. Okay. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Folks, that's pretty high, isn't it? You see, he starts off way up here. He could have been equal with God, but he thought not robbery to do that. Okay. Made himself of no reputation. Okay. He had to give up his station there. So he made himself of no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant. Made in the likeness of man. Now why would he put servant before man? Well, are angels servants of God? Yeah, folks, you could be a, you could be a servant and occupy a pretty high position still. But he, did, he didn't choose just a servant position. He chose to be a man servant. Okay, just like us. So another step downward. And then notice, he humbled himself. See, there's some men that are pretty proud and arrogant and boastful, aren't they? But not Jesus. He humbled himself. And he became what? Obedient. But not just obedient, but obedient even unto death. Even the death of the cross. Okay? Uh, so there's the <clears throat> downward progression. Then you have the uh, anabasis, the upper progression. Okay? God hath highly exalted him. He gave him a name. He gave him a name above every name. Now see, it's one thing to have a name, right? It's another thing to have a name above every name. Every knee should bow. So there's the action you fall before him. But not only do they just bow, they also what? 
Every tongue should confess. It's one thing to bow. It's another thing to confess who this person is. That Jesus is Lord. And notice this. To the glory of God the Father. So there's an anabasis. Okay? Conclusion very quickly, folks. When we understand figures of speech, the Bible becomes more than just words. Okay? Here's what we start doing. We start seeing phrases, don't we? You know, you don't just look at a word. Now I see a whole phrase. Not only do I see uh, a phrase, I'll oftentimes see patterns of words like the anabasis. Okay? Step, step, step. Either up or down. Okay? Anabasis or catabasis. We see pictures. That's what a hyperbole does, doesn't it? Okay? All the dust of the land became what? Lice. Can you just see it? You look down at the dust and all of a sudden, psst, lice pops up. Okay? Just see the picture right there in your mind. We see relationships. And folks, we see definitions given to us in the text. Something else that's wonderful about uh, figures of speech is they help us to memorize the Scripture, folks. Okay? When you understand that, a, that an anabasis is taking place in Psalm 1-1, then I, in my mind I immediately say, okay, there's going to be a what? A gradual increase in each statement. Okay? So what happens? Walk, stand, sit. See, I'm able to start memorizing that verse a whole lot easier. And that's one of the reasons God given us all these figures, folks. He wants us to understand the Bible. He wants us to put that Word of God deep in our hearts and remember it. Okay? And uh, so we'll talk about some more figures next week. Thank you, thank you.